In this video, I'm gonna make a Japanese riving brake. G'day, welcome to Chestnut and Egg. My name's Stuart Chignall, and if you don't know what a riving brake is, it's a tool that you use to hold wood as you are splitting it. Initially with a, a hatchet and wedges, but then with a fro. I've been using Japanese tools for about 15 years, and for a long time, I didn't think that the Japanese had a tool called a fro. But a little while ago, I found one. While they're rare, the Japanese do use furrows, but they've got their own unique style of riving brake, and that's what we're gonna be making today. Now this thing is the offcut from one of the beams when I made the apple press. So we're gonna ch check the videos out for that whole playlist, which is called Making Cider with an ax. I was pretty proud of that title. I was pretty proud of the press. We did a check the link out wherever it is up there. A bunch of the videos are from my original channel when I used to do all my videos at the same place. So a lot of my woodworking, my early woodworking videos are on that channel, Stuart Chignall. Had this sitting around for a while and we are now going to be converting it into one of these. And you can see from this photo, the, this Japanese carpenter has got notches cut, cut into this big block of wood to work as a riving brake. Now, because it's such a big piece of wood, I've got, to, I've got to choose an appropriate saw to cut it with. Just so happens that I have one here. So now that the saw is sharpened, let's have a crack at making our first cut. Not exactly complicated woodwork, but I did think of something that could have made it better. Because I'm gonna be storing the, the riving brake outside, it would be better if the bottom of that trench that we've just cut was uh, had a peak in it and then it sloped out towards the side. So any rain that fell on it would, would shed out of the cut and that would be less likely to uh, promote rot in the wood. Small detail and I'll, I might get around to doing that in a while, but right now, <coughs> no, I don't think that's gonna happen. I've got three fro to choose from, but the one I use most of the time is this big one because it's so chunky and so tough. And even if I'm doing a job that requires relative finesse, you're probably gonna start with a big piece of wood, which means I start with this fro. And the job that I have in mind, um, it's gonna require some beef. Now to really test out this riving brake, these pieces are a little bit too short, but the project I have in mind is the little stool that we could see in the photo of the Japanese riving brake. So I wanna split out uh, some small square stock out of these, which we can then dress up and then do the mortise and tenor in January, and then do a rush seat, just like in the photo. Well, you know that saying, uh, the plans of mice and men? Well, uh, I was right. Those little logs were a bit too short to really use on the riving brake. 
So then I moved on to these. Now these are the quarters from an ash log I got oh, a while ago. Um, and I quartered it so I could get it out of the garden where it was and it split really, you know, nicely. If you can see there, there's a, that's a pretty clean face, face there and it can, it's, pretty, it's split into really nice clean quarters. And once I break it down a little bit, so it will fit in the riving brake, it'll be perfect because when you're doing something with longer pieces and you, for, for you know, axe handles and pick handles and stuff, which is what these are before, you need that control that a riving brake brings to uh, get an even split and therefore maximize the efficiency of your, your billet of wood, like the number of handles you're gonna get out of it. But see here that it didn't split anywhere nearly as neatly as it did when I quartered it. In fact, damn thing wouldn't split at all. I wasn't able to use the riving brake. I had wedges and the fro and axes in there along the entire length of these billets to get it to come apart at all. It just, it would not release. I had to brute force it apart. So any hope of trying to control a split with the riving brake, completely out the door. Very good lesson though, which I'll be doing a video on, uh, basically boils down to when you get your material, split it out green. <laughs> because if there is any sort of interlocking in the grain or any sort of fiddleback, once it dries, it's gonna be the devil's own to get any sort of split at all, let alone one that's controlled. So what I did instead was got a piece of oak from the wood rack. Many oak species are known to be very easy to split, very easy to rive. And it's one of the reasons why the uh, First Fleet Col Colonials thought the Australian hardwoods were so rubbish because they couldn't use the techniques that they use for oak on Australian timbers. Well, most Australian timbers. And just look at that. What a difference that makes. All right, for starters, you can see it's splitting roughly down the middle already. So let's try and uh, maintain that split in the center. Now what's happening there is that the grain has got a slight curve in it and the split has come down, it's hit that curve and it's ramping up into it. And that means that we've got a fat side and a thin side. Because the, the thin side is thinner, it's being deflected more and that puts more tension on the fibers, which means that the split will tend to run into that tension and run out of that piece of wood. But with the control that we've got with the riving brake, what we can do, is deflect the fat piece of wood, you know, bend it and stretch it, put it under tension, and that will, that, that doesn't allow us to escape the natural grain of the wood because it's got, it does have this curve in it. But it means that once we get past that natural deflection in the grain, we can bring the split back to level. And then once we will, and then when the split is going down this way, we can then flip the wood over to then even the split out and then have it roughly centered for the rest of the way. And that's what a riving brake allows you to do. It can't overcome you know, defects in the wood, but it allows you to sort of wiggle past them if it's possible. This is simultaneously one of the benefits of riven wood and one of its biggest defects. If there is any defects in the log, you're gonna end up with less usable timber than you would if you, if you sawed it. But also the advantage is, is that when I come to select uh, pieces for a, a piece of furniture or a bow or whatever, I'm going to see that hump in the split and I'm gonna know that the grain follows that path. And there's two things I can do there. Either I reject the piece of wood because I know I'm gonna to have to plane that flat, which means I'm gonna be cutting the fibers, or alternatively, I can build that flow of the grain into the project and make an exceptionally strong piece of timber. Whereas with a sawn piece of timber, I wouldn't be able but like with many traditional crafts, it takes time, it takes skill, and there are reasons why we use machines a lot these days. Now, I hope you enjoyed that. I will be doing more projects with the fro and with the riving brake. No idea when, because it's gonna depend on when I can get some green logs, green material in which to split them down. Because, uh, yeah, the stuff I've got at the moment isn't gonna work. What I am going to be doing though is I do, but I do have a lot of handles to make, which is why I was splitting the ash. Those videos will be coming up in due course. Plus, 
very soon I hope to announce the details of the group buy order for a whole stack of uh, chisels from a smith that I've been talking to in Japan. Still not there with the details, but it is coming. And, and as soon as the video comes out about that, there'll be a whole stack of discounts available for, for, for people that are ordering them because we'll be pre-ordering them and because we'll be buying a whole stack of together at once. That means that you will get them cheaper. Stay tuned for that. And if you don't want to miss it, subscribe, hit the bell notification all, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye. I was just reviewing that footage and I realized that I hadn't told you what I thought about the Japanese wiring brake. Well, I've been pretty impressed. The biggest thing I'm impressed with is how small a footprint it has. Western style wiring brakes are quite large in their footprint. And while they're very easy to take down and set up, it takes time and it's annoying. Whereas I can see you know, a block of wood like this to be used as a wiring brake just being slipped underneath the bench or something or being used for a range of other tasks, like I did when I was, uh, you know, splitting these logs. It's just, you know, it's a good base chopping block to, to do some, you know, trimming on and stuff. You can see it being used for a number of things rather than just a riving brake. And I was also pleased with the amount of control that I had. That was one of the concerns I had because with a Western riving brake, you can push down on the wood and really get your weight onto it. But I didn't find that that was an issue um, with it in the vertical position, which was a bit of surprise. So I wouldn't say uh, Japanese driving brakes are superior, but I'd certainly say they have some advantages in some situations, and space being the biggest one. So I hope you enjoyed. Catch you later.